organised by the Global Drug Policy Observatory and co-sponsored by the Netherlands. <clears throat> As you may know, the Netherlands is a staunch supporter uh, of evidence-based policy making. We had a side event on this issue earlier this week and we were glad to note that the EU resolution on data collection for the purpose of evidence-based policy making commanded such broad support in the CND. On today's topic, on drug crypto markets, however, there has been surprisingly little research. That is why we are happy to have some eminent researchers on this topic here uh, in front of you beside me. Crypto markets continue to function in 2020 despite a number of high profile law enforcement actions against drug crypto markets. Data suggests that the purchases of drugs on the crypto markets remain robust and in Europe are even increasing. At the same time, the results of taking down some crypto markets are debatable, as I understand it. The Netherlands has had a leading role in drug crypto market operations. What have we done right? What have we done wrong? What should policymakers and law enforcement agencies take into account when dealing with drug crypto markets? What have been the effects of previous actions? What worked and what did not? You can learn from the latest research on this issue from the academics and practitioners beside me. Let me introduce them to you. To my left, there is Mr. Martin Horton Edison. He is a lecturer in international relations at Cardiff University, and he is also a research officer at the Global Drug Policy Observatory with oversight responsibility for GDPO's Drug Crypto Market Research Project. To my right side, Mr. Fernando Padilla. He's currently a resident physician at Energy Control, a Spanish-based international harm reduction project aimed at people who use drugs, mainly in nightlife settings, as I understand it. He's also known to many of you as the Silk Rose Doctor X. Dr. Cordovia is an experienced medical doctor, and he's committed to providing honest and impartial medical advice to drug users with the goal of reducing the harms associated with consumption and he published widely in academic journals and has provided health advice on a number of drug crypto markets over nearly a decade. Then to the right side of Mr. Godovia, Professor Judith Aldrich. She's Professor of Criminology at Manchester University and also a research associate at GDPO. Mrs. Aldrich's research is focused on drug markets, policy and substance use. Over the last five years, she has pioneered research in the area of drug crypto markets and accordingly has acted in advisory and expert capacity to agencies including the Pompidou Group of the Council of Europe, the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Abuse, and EMCDDA, and the European Commission. And then to my left, Mr. Patrick Shortish. Shortish, he is also from Manchester University, a PhD candidate in criminology and researcher at GPO, research in crypto markets and covered networks. We will start now with a presentation by Mr. Martin Horton Edison and Dr. Colombia, Dr. X, and then allow for questions and answers from, uh, from the floor to the entire panel. So please be prepared for some uh, food for thought. Mr. Horton Edison, Mr. Colombia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for such a, a detailed, comprehensive introduction. I very much appreciate the Netherlands' support on this uh, issue. <laughs> Good start. Okay. So, a very, very brief reintroduction to crypto markets for those who are perhaps a little, a little less familiar. So, uh, the advent of drug crypto markets in the early 2010s represented something of a step change in the modes of drug supply by facilitating anonymous cross border drug transactions, crypto markets leverage internet technologies to enable direct yet global and transnational connections for vendors and buyers. The application of anonymous browser tools, secure against identification by law enforcement and of course by each other, <coughs> reducing both the likelihood of detection by law enforcement as well as instances of market violence. The use of cryptocurrencies facilitates payment outside of the extant international financial systems, regulations and investigation powers, and user confidence is assured by anonymity, escrow payment systems, product and vendor feedback ratings, and accurate product descriptions. Approaching a decade old, 
Drug crypto markets are no longer the new thing on the block, but in fact represent an established and maturing issue area for international drug control. Very briefly, the international response. Okay. Historically, the global drug control apparatus has been slow-ish to fully comprehend the potential uh, of the internet drugs nexus uh, to impact global drug supply modalities. Before 2010, the issue was largely considered an internet advertising issue and came under the 1988 convention. Since then, um, the big three, if you like, conventions have been uh, supplemented by the Council of Europe's uh, Budapest Convention, along with an admixture of UN conventions, including the Transnational of Organised Crime and the um, Convention Against Corruption, as well as a series of resolutions produced in this building, which have been utilised to provide mandates for action such as uh, capacity building and technical assistance programs. However, although there is general agreement in the international system that crypto markets are somewhat bad, uh, there remains no clear or direct instrument or indeed an international agreement to any kind of common approach. Instead, the international response is built on and adapted from the instruments available to it rather before the advent of crypto markets. And the, advent, the addition of the Budapest Convention, together with the other conventions I've named, uh, have been co-opted in order to produce something of an eclectic approach, uh, which logically results in something of a confused overall crypto markets strategy at the international level. So... This is the original Silk Road takedown notice. Um, the takedown by the FBI of the first well-known drug crypto market, the Silk Road, in October 2013, successfully removed the first major market. However, the, the takedown, we'll call it a takedown, generated significant offline and online media interest in crypto markets, and therefore rather served to increase public awareness of this new mode of supply, and traffic to and the number of subsequent markets increased as a consequence. Okay, so the effects of enforcement, this takedown strategy. Research shows the seizure operations uh, that result in crypto markets closing have had short-term impacts and users simply migrate to the next largest platform to continue trading. Overall trade volume on crypto markets is typically measured by examining the feedbacks left by customers and these are only given when a transaction has taken place. Following the closure of the Silk Road by multi-agency law enforcement, Overall sales volumes across marketplaces returned to pre-bus levels within four months. And after the 2014 closure of multiple markets in operation Onimus, the recovery time was in fact cut in half, and the overall sales volume exceeded pre-bus levels within two months. Whilst the 2017 operation uh, to close both Alpha, May, Alpha Bay and Hansa market may have been technically and strategically sophisticated, the impacts were again, alas, short-lived. <coughs> Research shows that the overall trade volume across crypto markets recovered within a month of the Alpha Bay closure and in a matter of weeks after the Hansa market closure. In short, markets and users seem to be recovering faster from disturbances caused by law enforcement operations and crypto markets continue to grow more profitably. A secondary consequence is target hardening hence the image in the slide. Uh, takedowns of con uh, market, conventional takedown strategies of markets spur marketplace innovation, aimed at reducing the vulnerability of those who use the markets to law enforcement operations and arrest. Uh, this uh, increases the technical sophistication of the markets and the resilience of the users and determination of those involved. One empirical study showed how the FBI seizure of the original Silk Road actually accelerated the adoption of innovative multi-signature escrow technologies, and moreover, even though the lifespan of individual crypto market platforms is often short-lived, the entire ecosystem as a whole has tended to be highly resilient to law enforcement. So the Dutch approach. Beginning with the active involvement in Europol's Operation Anonymous against Silk Road 2 back in November 2014, the Netherlands has since taken a global leadership role in counter-drug crypto market operations. In recent years, the Netherlands has established the specialised Netherlands High Tech Crime Unit, NHTCU, 
And the Netherlands also chair Europol's Joint Cybercrime Action Task Force, JCAT, with the US's FBI acting as vice chair, including liaison officers from 16 countries comprising 10 EU member states and 16 external states, including the US, New Zealand, and Canada. And the Netherlands have therefore been instrumental in evolving uh, an increasingly nuanced and innovative <coughs> approach, leading the way in strategizing and enforcing against the markets. Rather than immediate takedown, the Dutch approach focuses on undermining trust in the markets, and this is achieved by infiltration using smaller intelligence-led specialist units uh, that are both flexible and adapted to their environment, and by embedding enforcement agents within the anonymous online population. For example, live markets were infiltrated for intelligence in operations Ben and uh, Graysack, and in 2017, and this marked a strategic shift, I would consider, in enforcement thinking and practice. So the Hansa operation. Just to illustrate, uh, Great Sack targeted the Hansa market, which the, once the largest dark web market in Europe. At its height, Hansa's 3,600 dealers offered more than 24,000 drug product listings, uh, from cocaine and heroin to MDMA and cannabis as well as smaller trade in fraud and other tools. Um, as part of Bayonet against Alpha Bay, the Netherlands investigators identified two uh, administrators in Germany <coughs> before covertly operating the two arrested men's accounts to take full control of the site itself. Uh, this intelligently crafted operation meant the Netherlands HTCU uh, were able to create a real-time copy of the market database uh, within their own jurisdiction. Uh, and this enabled them to surveil Hansa's buyers and vendors, many of whom migrated to Hansa directly after the closure of Alphabay, and discreetly altered the site's code uh, to obtain more identifying information from those users, and even um, convinced dozens of Hansa's anonymous vendors to open a beacon file um, on their computers to reveal their location. It gathered significant evidence. Bitcoin wallet addresses, withdrawal pins, PGP keys, Logging details, and in some cases through the um, through the ability to exploit the multi-six system, uses real IP addresses. The action was followed up in 2018, February 2018, by um, knock and talk operations, um, targeting customers and vendors who had been using the market. The information has also provided leads for law enforcement on vendor activities, and as such, the Netherlands pioneers an intelligence-led approach that recognises the importance of the markets as sources of real-time intelligence rather than simply shutting them down and intelligence instantly becoming historic. However, although ultimately taking down the markets after such operations, the Dutch approach exemplifies evolved enforcement practices of operating markets in order to gather intelligence using well-trained teams and aiming to undermine the trust and confidence in the market. And this goes some way to improving the otherwise often temporary or illusory successes of pure takedown enforcement operations. Although, it must be said, after these operations, the markets are, of course, taken down. <coughs> Despite previous takedown operations providing key learning points for law enforcement operations, crypto markets, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, continue to function in 2020. And more recent enforcement efforts suggest an awareness that closing platforms alone, takedown alone, is not enough to destabilise the, the growing crypto market drug trade. Indeed, there has been some short-term successes, but ultimately purchases on crypto market remain robust and are indeed increasing inside Europe. Um, so the Dutch approach appears to have uh, involvement in some other positive effects, I should say, including contribute, contributing to self-regulation of the markets, i.e. some markets banning or removing specific substances in the main fentanyl or fentanyl analogues. Uh, and although impossible to say for definite, anecdotal evidence from forum discussions suggests that these practices may also occur as a consequence of negative perception among users and administrators of such substances, particularly fentanyl. A second effect appears to show entire markets voluntarily going offline uh, due to a trust perception, which marks some success of the Dutch approach, uh, as exemplified by Dream Market sub-closure at the end of April 2019. Um, and I should again reiterate that that said, takedown markets, either voluntarily or by law enforcement actions, are quickly replaced by rivals. Comprehending how 
and why even evolved strategies like the Dutch approach are unable to effectively enforce against the phenomena is of critical importance to many of us in this room. Uh, I'm going to skip over the international position due to time and go to the call for evidence. As presented here, analysis of the increasing, increasing body of academic research appears to show that there may also be some unintended consequences of any approach that ultimately results in takedown. Specifically, it is plausible that as with offline interventions, disrupting the online markets may have less than optimum effects. The international position calls for more engagement with evidence uh, from the scientific community and deepening these links, as proposed here, may augment the evolving approach to the markets to help maximise positive effects and minimise less desirable outcomes, such as target hardening and profit uh, incentive vending. Construction of a further nuanced approach grounded in an evidence-based UN-wide policy rather than a purely law enforcement-led approach might be a significant next step to reducing instances of some of the less desirable consequences of takedown. So, finally from me, before I move over to uh, the highlight of the show, Dr. X, um, a, a quick note on harm. <coughs> Plants created by unregulated illegal drug markets in part result from the unknown content and purity of drugs sold. One, one example of this I've mentioned is fentanyl, an inexpensive but highly potent adulterant often missold in the US as heroin and partly responsible for driving up US opioid related deaths. Drug harms also derive from the circumstances in which illegal drugs are produced, trafficked and sold. In legal markets, transactional disputes can be referred to police or other state agencies tasked with adjudicating in buying and selling. But because illegal drug markets are unregulated, stateless activities, buyers and sellers must resolve disputes themselves. And therefore, that the illegality of markets um, can make harms like violence and disorder an inevitable part of drug supply. So what does the scientific evidence tell us about whether the crypto market drug trade reduces exacerbates or leaves intact these harms. Drug sales on crypto markets are dominated by those who are uh, associated with relatively low levels of harm in comparison to alcohol, heroin and crack cocaine. Data collected directly from the market shows that cannabis, MDMA and psychedelics take, uh, together account for nearly two-thirds, 62% of market trade. And survey research corroborates this finding with cannabis and MDMA, the most commonly purchased drugs on the markets. The substance is typically associated with problematic drug use, such as heroin, crack cocaine, and methamphetamine, are far less commonly traded on the markets. A second effect um, <laughs> crypto market buying requires technological resources and skills. Buyers, therefore, are young uh, and technically adept, and as a consequence, um, Purchases also need to be made in days in advance for intended consumption, i.e. problematic substances are therefore uh, not, um, may not be uh, preferred for direct supply. This may in part explain the relatively small revenue generated by drugs like heroin and crack cocaine. So, Dr. X is going to talk about um, purity and the work that's being conducted at Energy Control uh, in Spain. Um, and just a quick note on this, the work that Dr. X produces is used by UNODC and it's part of this uh, general piece that expertise and scientific knowledge must be used to inform uh, drug policy. So here's the first slide for Dr. X. <coughs> 